the next menu, which is wireless. And this menu mostly deals with access point configuration and the radio features and configuration. So the first thing you see is the list of access point right here. This is the access point we currently have registered. Very similar to what we have under the monitor page with the access point, but this is more towards the configuration side of things as opposed to statistic and information of the access point. So here we got some uptime, admin state, operational status, operating power, number of clients, if it's directly connected, what port, so on and so forth. All right, and you can click into it and to get under the configuration page. All right, and there's uh, even more menu under there that you can configure it. And we'll look at this when we start configuring the access point. And then if you want to modify radio specific configuration of the access point, then you would click under the radio submenu and choose the radio frequency that you want to modify. So here we got the H211 ANAC and might be a little bit hidden on the right hand side here. Um, there's a menu where you can click to configure it. And basically what you can do here is to override the global configuration, things like the RF channel assignment or the transmit power. And if you want to turn off the particular frequency and the access point altogether, you can switch it to disable. Okay, so that's for ANAC. The next one is BGN, but the ID is the same. And actually, there's also a right underneath the configure, there's also a way to pull up a detail page that will give you even more information on the radio as well. A okay, band radio is when you have a radio module installed on the supported model of access point. Like what we have here is a, as you can see, 3702 access point under the AP model. And we currently have a module install RM3000. And that will show up as a third radio slot. Okay, right underneath is the global configuration, and these are the global parameters that you can configure for all of the access points. And we'll go through this uh, more when we deal with the access point himself. The next menu is the advanced menu, and this contains some of the more advanced radio features, parameters, things like load balancing, band select, RX sub threshold, optimized uh, routing. Okay. Next we have the mesh, which strictly deals with uh, configuration parameters for mesh AP. So if you plan to deploy a mesh access point, this is one of the places you'll come in and perform your configuration. Next menu is RF profile, which is a way to configure group specific RF parameters for the APs. So instead of having to configure your RF parameters globally with the more recent release of file, um, software on the controller, you'll be able to group the APs together and have them perform under different sets of RF parameters. Okay, so right off the box, we have these uh, different type of profile pre-built into the controller for a different operating environment, things like high client density, low client density, and typical client density. Right next, we have a menu for Flex Connect. And Flex Connect is just another AP mode that the AP can operate under. And this is typically used for remote sites to optimize the user data routing. And we'll talk more when we get around to the Flex Connect video. Along with that is FlexConnect ACL, FlexConnect VLAN template. Moving along is our OEAP ACL, which we'll skip for now. And we're probably going to have a separate video for that as well. OEAP is, stands for Office Extent AP. So if you heard that acronym before, and that's just part of the configuration. Same thing, network list, we're going to go ahead and skip. And I believe this part of the tunneling that we... Um, saw earlier under the controller menu. All right, next we have the actual radio global configuration where there's 802.11 A and C or BGN. And these are platform level configuration for all the radio parameters. Things like transmit, power control, dynamic channel assignment, coverage hole detection, RF group, roaming, 
some of the QoS stuff. DFS for dynamic frequency selection, high throughput, data rates, and clean air. Okay. You have pretty much the similar sets of menus under the BGN as well. So we talked about the radio configuration. We'll come back and revisit each of these configurable options more extensively. Media stream is another feature for the controller to deal with multicast traffic. And this is to enable multicast direct features, also known as video stream. So it's just to optimize multicast transmission by converting the multicast traffic to unicast, and that way you can take advantage of the faster unicast data rate. So this is where you configure that. More configuration for AVC. This is where you, we saw this has been enabled on our SSID. What you can do is to create a profile to match certain applications, and you can either apply certain type of QoS marking or drop the traffic out together. And that's the purpose of ABC. Next is the country. So you have to select the appropriate country where the control will be operating in. Hopefully by default it will be selected correctly. Like us here we're in United States. By default it's uh, selected. And I believe that's what's part of the initialization or doing the setup as well to select the correct country. All right then you have a net flow. If you want to export the traffic information to external NetFlow collector, such as uh, Cisco Prime, then we can add them right here. All right, and the last menu here is the QoS profiles and QoS roles. And we'll come back and talk about QoS profiles when we deal with voice over wireless. And that's all we have under the wireless menu. The next menu over is security. So obviously, Security is one of the biggest uh, component for wireless. And I guess that's why there's almost a dedicated menu for security because there's a lot that you can configure it and turn on as far as security is concerned on the controller. Starting off with the AAA related configuration, you can add a radius server, authentication accounting. If you wish to do uh, a rate external radius authentication on your WLAN, then you have the TACX, which is for the device admin on the controller. Well, for the most part anyway, I mean, you can use TACX for user authentication as well, if you like. Then you have the LDAP integration. We can add the LDAP server. So LDAP can be used for user database for some of the type of authentication, whether it's for local admin or wireless user. And in addition to supporting external user database, the WireSign controller can also store local user, and this is under the local net users. And these users can be used for guests, for example, where you can create a account and use it as part of the user authentication. Next is the MAC filtering. And in addition to the user database, you also have a MAC address database. And this is when you want to perform MAC address based filtering as part of your WLAN authentication. Then you can keep adding the device, the MAC address that you want to allow to access the network. Disable clients, it's pretty much like a blacklist of MAC addresses that the controller will deny from network access. So if the you want to block based on MAC address, then you can add it right here. User lock-in policy is just defining the maximum number of concurrent lock-in for the username, and by default it's five. AP policy, and this is control how the APs are being accepted by the controller as part of the registration. And there's different type of authentication that you can enforce upon the AP registration and not just blindly accept any registration from any AP. So we'll look at that. I believe it could be a next video is when we look at the AP registration. And for that section, there's a password policy that you can enforce the password complexity, whether it's for the local management user or APs or even the SNMPv3 user. All right next, we have the local EAP. So the controller itself can act as a radius server. If you don't have an external radius server, which is always recommended, then for example, if you want to do like a quick test and want to perform radius authentication, then you can configure the controller to support certain type of EAP authentication. 
right? And then you have the advanced EAP, which is all the low level parameters to control the EAP behavior, all sorts of timeout and retries. For the most part, you probably don't need to touch this page, but there might come times where you need to adjust it in some specialized situation. Then you have the priority order for a management user. This controls what database you want to use for authenticating a use lock-in to the controller web interface. So by default, it's pointing to the local database and radius if you have that configured. Then you have a menu for a certificate. And this is when you want to utilize the LSC, which stands for locally signed certificate or SSC. Then we have access lists. And there's a different type of access list that are being used throughout the system. The most common one is just generic access control list that probably similar to what you might see on the firewall, just a basic layer three, layer four type of uh, access list. Then you have the CPU access list to limit the type of traffic that can hit the control CPU, which is similar to things like control plane security on where there is a switch or a router. So you can enable that and then kind of tie to access list to it, but instead the access list will be protecting the CPU as opposed to the traffic that's passing through. Okay, then you also have a Flex Connect access list that when you deal with the Flex Connects AP. Okay, and then there's also a layer two access list. Then we have a menu for wireless protection policy that deals with things like uh, rogue access points or clients. Uh, this is where you set up the rules for rogue detection. Built-in um, IDS, which is something that the controller comes with, some of the standard signatures, well-known wireless attack, although it's not as extensive, but it's something that comes with the controller. A additional protection, things like client exclusion policies that protect the system from misbehaving client. It can deny in client for extended period of time, which is client exclusion, AP authentication, and management frame protection. Then you have the web authentication where you can define your user login web portal specifically related to guest login and, for example, where you want the web portal to be used as the internally built portal or if it's a external server that's hosting your web portal and some really basic customization and the certificate that goes along with the portal. Right, then we have TrustSec, SXP, WiseLine controller can participate in a TrustSec domain, although not fully as far as the SGT or security group tacking. Uh, but you can participate through the SXP protocol where you can send the IP to SGT uh, or to the TAC. And the SXP stands for Secure Group TAC Exchange Protocol. All right, then you have the local policy, which gives you the ability to enforce different levels of access based on the user identity, authentication, and device type. And that kind of works hand in hand with the result that you get out of the lo device local profiling. Right, and we have a dedicated video talking about local device profiling and local policies. And the last section here is the advanced section, and these are to do with all the IDS sensors and some of the certificate that goes along with it. And that's all we have for the security. Moving on to the next tab, which is management. So under the management menu, these are the configurable options for managing the controller. There's not a whole lot uh, to look at here. A basic summary page, configuration of SNMP. So I click under general, you got the name. Might as well, since this is kind of considered basic configuration of the controller, let's go ahead and configure SNMP. So location, let's do lap minute HQ, for example. Contact, let's just do IT support at lapminutes.com. SNMP version, let's go ahead and use version three. So to create a user, then that's the menu right underneath, create SNMP v3 user. Let's call them S LM SNMP. That will be read write. So this account, we're gonna use that when we uh, add the controller to prime infrastructure. HMAC SHA is good enough for authentication protocol. And passwords just do Cisco one two three four five six seven. I believe it has to be um, a certain length. 
So let's just make sure it's long enough. Same thing, we're going to do AES 128, Cisco 123567, and then confirm that. Okay, click apply. Now that we have the SNMP version 3 created, next is the SNMP community by default. The controller comes with the well known public private, and it's always a good idea to remove that from the system and make sure that nobody can just uh, SNMP poll. Our controller using those uh, well-known community string. But once we delete that, we can add our own. Let's use community name Cisco, although you probably wouldn't use anything as simple as that in your production. Should be good enough for our lab. And then for the IP address, we're just going to do the whole 32.0 slash 24 subnet.0. You can do that read write. Just make sure that our management system has full access. And click apply. All right, if you wish to send SNMP trap to an external management system, then you can add a trap. Come your name. Let's just do Cisco again. And then this is where we're going to be pointing to our prime infrastructure server. Enable apply. All right? Trap control is just a way to filter out the trap uh, type of messages that you want to send over trap and just simply check or uncheck the relevant checkboxes. Trap lock is just a page that contain the trap lock. HTTP, HTTPS by default, you can see HTTP access, is, which is good. And we always want to do secure HTTP or HTTPS. If you want to upload a trusted cert to be used with the web interface, then this is where you will be able to do that. Right here, download SSL certificate. Okay. Telnet should always be disabled. That's what has happened with the SSH being enabled. You can uh, adjust the bolt rate for your zero port. No need to make any change on that. Local management user, this is where you can add a local admin user by default is the account username admin that we created as part of the setup. You'll be able to provide access privilege and that can be read only, read write, or if you deal with a guest account administration, you can assign the lobby admin privilege to the account. All right, next is the user session, which is the list of current CLI session. We don't have anything, so it's currently empty. Now, syslog configuration, if you want to export the syslog to a server, in this case, again, we're going to enter our prime infrastructure IP address. And then you can set the syslog level as well as the facility. All right, next is the management viewer wireless. So if you want to be able to access this web interface right here while you're connected to the SSID that belongs to that particular controller, then you would come in here and enable management viewer wireless. Um, although Somebody might perceive that as a security risk. So that's why by default, it's always recommended to have that disabled. So what it means is you need to come in through the wired or SSID from the controller in order to hit the controller admin page. Okay, so we're going to keep that unchecked. Software activation, this is how you would manage your controller licenses. For the AP license, you can see here, uh, it tells you the usage of the license, whether or not it's in use, the priority, and if you're using the eval, it tells you the amount of time remains to, before the expiration. So here, license usage, our controller, I have, for example, a maximum support of five APs. We currently have one registered, so that means you have four remaining, right? And under command, this is where you come in once you uh, fulfill your PAC key on the Cisco licensing websites, then you'll get a license file. This is where you'll be able to come in here and select the license file via the TFTP and install it. All right, and then you have tech support, which is the menu related to if you perform, for example, troubleshooting with a Cisco TAC engineer, it might ask you to come in here and grab certain sets of information for them, as well as enabling things like core dump. All right, so we're getting close to um, 
the end here, we only have probably one menu left because it's not much under help or feedback. So let's go ahead and finish this up. Under the commands, you've got a download file and upload file. So this is from the perspective of controller. So download file meaning download a file to the controller. Not so much of download it to your desktop. So controller, you'll be able to download the code for code upgrade. You can download configuration signature files. If you do like a guest web authentication, you can download a customized web bundle. Some of the certificates, lock-in banners, uh, device profile, OUI updates, right? And you have an option of TFTP, FTP, SFTP, and HTTP. Upload, again, from the perspective of uploading from the controller. And so this is, if you want to, for example, do like a backup of configuration, you would come in here and select upload configuration from controller, as well as the other upload options that you can see here, right? And this is usually for backup purposes or pulling out like crash files. If you need to reboot the controller for whatever reason, you can come in here and click on reboot and you have an option to save or not save before reboot. Config boot uh, by default, uh, controller maintains two copies of the software. You will be able to select which copy you would like the controller to boot from, whether it's the primary or the backup. Okay, so currently our primary image is 81102, which is the one that we are operating. And our backup image is the 8.0. Okay, so you'll be able to easily switch between the two images just by selecting this. You can also schedule a reboot for any reason, whether it reboot at certain time of days or reboot within the time frame, right? And if you want to cancel the reboot, then you can clear the reboot. Reset to factory default is what we did in the last video to clear out all the configs on the controller and not the APs. If you want to clear config on the APs and you have to clear it on individual APs. All right, set time. If you want to manually adjust the system time, then you can come in here and do that. But hopefully you have the NTP server set up so we don't have to deal with this, both date and time. But you're still going to have to adjust the time zone unless you went through the setup and correctly select that like we did, Pacific time. And the last option here is the lock-in banner, which I believe is part of, it has to be downloaded to the controller right here, but you'll be able to clear them under the lock-in banner menu. Okay, help is just take you to the documentations, 8.1, so make sure it points to the correct link on the Cisco website, uh, feedback, so it's just a link to take you to an external link that you can provide feedback on the product. All right, now, so what we left with here is the menu option on the top right. Every time you make configuration changes to the controller, it does not get saved by default. So you make sure that you click save configuration, otherwise it will be lost after reboot. Okay, it's one of the common mistake people make. They make a whole lot of changes and then forgot to save it. I do that from time to time as well. So just a... Uh, make it your habit to do that. You can perform a ping from this web interface. If you want to ping certain IPs, for example, I want to ping the NTP server. That's just a quick way to validate that the certain IPs are reachable from the controller. I mean, you can perform the same thing through the command line, but if you're already on the GUI, you can do that. All right, and you can refresh, uh, lock out, obvious enough, or you can click on home to go back to the dashboard page or whatever page that you set as part of your landing page setting here. All right, so at this point, we've gone through the main menu options on the controllers, and this at least should give you some ideas of where things are located. Now, there's not a whole lot of configuration actions that were done uh, in this videos, but sometimes it's a good idea just to kind of get a sense of, you know, how to navigate the controller. As you can see, there's a lot of menus, and without knowing where things are, you might not be able to find the menu that you need to get under to configure certain features. And again, although some of these may not make a whole lot of sense to you, especially when I mentioned the name of the features, and if you're new to the Cisco Wireless, but that's okay because we are going to kind of dive into more detail as we progress through our video series. So now that we get the introduction to the web interface out of the way, we can now start working on our configuration. And the first thing we're going to do in our next video is to look into the basic behind the access point registration. 
And that wraps up our video on WiseLine Controller Introduction to Web Interface. You can visit our website to view an extensive list of our lab videos and sign up to get access to additional lab contents. Thank you for watching labmates.com and I'll see you guys in the next videos.